This is a question concerning both space and time. Now, if one uses photomultipliers and scintillators, early arrival times can actually happen if a particle doesn't hit the scintillator but hits directly the photomultiplier and makes some Cherenko flight, for example. Now, it so happens that your average uh, delay time is just 60 nanoseconds. So did you check whether it's possible that some spray particles, instead of going to the scintillator, hit the photomultiplier, in particular as you always take the first one? Yeah, so uh, for what concerns the photomultiplier, we are, uh, you should uh, uh, take into account that we are in a, in a really very quiet environment. So we have been checking also uh, these rates uh, uh, when, uh, by taking measurements when the photomultiplier is disconnected from the fibers. We have been measuring uh, the dark count of the photomultipliers underground and so on. So this is a quiet environment. Then for what concerns the earliest heat, uh, we also performed some uh, cross-checks uh, because, uh, as I mentioned, we go through this Monte Carlo simulation which has, uh, to which we attributed uh, an uncertainty of uh, 3 nanoseconds, a systematic uncertainty of 3 nanoseconds. And, uh, uh, yes, this one. So we have been checking, for instance, uh, by comparing the... Uh, On track with respect to this earliest hit, we found uh, differences at the nanosecond level which are co comparable with the uh, uncertainty that we are assuming on the simulation. Or we have been checking also the average time of the event without performing track reconstruction with respect to the earliest hit. Uh, Tiziano, you had another question? Uh, I'm, I'm trying to be diligent, so now I have a question on timing. Now, concerning this uh, correction, I mean, I think you pointed out that the uh, beam, beam current transformer, yes. you, besides checking it out with the pulser, which is basically the cesium source, you, you wanted to see what was the response to proton. I think that was a very good idea. In fact, uh, we, we have lived through difficulties in, uh, for, for estimating the luminosity at LHC <laughs> coming from the, the current transformer. Uh, now. The point is that what you check there is really, I think, a different situation from what uh, is the protons which you use. Because uh, you, you said you use an LHC injection cycle. So that is 15 nanoseconds spacing of bunches which are a factor 10 at least intensity compared to the one you use, which are instead the 5 nanoseconds separated at much lower intensity. Now, again, I mean, I, I agree with you that you are measuring a, a, essentially the length of a cable. On the other end, it's obvious that uh, I'm not sure that, uh, the, if you, that you are using a representative proton uh, bunch going through it and, and structure. So can you so, comment on that? Yes. Yeah. No, you're, you're, I've also it's a good before, question. Again, again yeah. on the thing, I have another question. I mean, you showed in your analysis the effect of having zero nanosecond yes. uh, difference, or 1,048, yeah. which was the, uh, the wrong, if you like, before opening the, yes. the box, yes. Yes. Uh, calibration. Uh, I wonder how the chi-square would change from your feet if you moved no. it by by. I will, by, I will, by, I will, by show, I will show you something. Uh, you're right. Even the so, depending basically on for, the for what concerns the BCT, I didn't give uh, all the details. So, so we performed also this calibration by injecting a signal from the cesium clock to the test input. So the test input is just a, another. Uh, 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 winding around the toroidal transformer which detects the beam. Eh? So this uh, result uh, is in agreement with the result uh, of, uh, which we got with the beam, with the LHC beam. And then we took also measurements with the CNGS beam. Eh? And with the CNGS beam we have also a comparable result, but we have larger uncertainty. And the larger uncertainty is due to the fact that with the CNGS beam, eh, you have a, a continuous beam, and then uh, it's difficult to uh, make this kind of overlay that you see here, which here is uh, unambiguous, because you have this comb that you have to overlay. In the case of the CNGS beam, you have an ambiguity of uh, a couple uh, of uh, batches, 
which brings uh, the systematic uncertainty to 10 nanoseconds, but uh, the measurement was comparable. So at the end, uh, we uh, decided to use this measurement with the where there are no ambiguities in uh, uh, deciding who is who. Then for what concerns the other question that you, you raised, the one related to the, uh, to the change, because uh, here you are right, uh, it's difficult to see how it, uh, the distribution will compare if you uh, assume no effect. So there, there are some distributions that I can show you where you can compare the uh, no effect, so the TOF uh, computed assuming the speed of light to the one. Okay, so here, th these are the distribution of the fronts. That is just part of the information. It doesn't uh, depend just on that. So here you see uh, what happens if you have no effect. So you have a systematic displacement of the red curve with respect to the experimental points. And this is by taking the effect coming from the likelihood of the maximization, which is 60.7 nanoseconds. So you see this kind of systematical displacement. And then this is for the first extraction. Then mentally, you have to combine to the same information from the second extraction, which is shown here. And also here, you see the same picture. There is a, a systematic anticipation of the points with respect to the curve, which is then fixed when you take the outcome of the likelihood. So this is just to give you a, an idea of the kind of effect that you could uh, imagine to see on the fronts. Just a question. Sorry, John first. Uh, you will come later. Okay. Yeah, John. So, so uh, looking at the uh, Minos paper from a few years ago, it seems that the dominant timing uncertainties are not associated with GPS and all that stuff, but actually internal to the detector. And uh, in particular, the, the largest individual error seems to be associated with the uh, antenna fiber length. And they make the comment that they've measured this in several different ways and they got different answers. Correct. So, so my question to you, I guess, is how were you able to control this uncertainty, a factor of 10 better than what they were? That's correct. It's a very good question. I'm happy you ask it. So, first of all, for what concerns the antenna, they didn't go to a institute, apparently. Our receivers were calibrated with the antenna cable as well. And you have seen the kind of agreement that then we got when PTB made this independent measurement. This exactly relies on this kind of calibrations like the internal delay of the detector and so on. So there are means of calibrating this very precisely. I don't know why they didn't do that, but it can be done even rather quickly, this kind of operation. For what concerns the fibers, uh, we, as I mentioned before, we don't measure the fibers by themselves because then you go in this kind of uh, situations where you use a technique which maybe is related to a different wavelength, uh, to different equipment and so on. So we try to perform an inclusive measurement where we were measuring the delay which uh, uh, comes out from the two equipments before and after the transmission of the fibers, but we didn't measure the fiber individually. This is an inclusive measurement between two, two reference points of the uh, timing chain. And this we repeated two times with the cesium and even by making this two-part measurement with another fiber, and they agreed we, at the uh, nanosecond level. Maybe my timing friends uh, would like to comment also on this. I, I think your explanation was perfect and everybody understood it. I, I just wanted to say that um, I thank you for your kind words and for the timing team at CERN. It was a, an incredible experience to wor work with uh, you and with Julia. Thank you. Uh, just a curiosity. Uh, there is some time dependence of this result. Uh, I mean, uh, did you try to compare the results uh, analyzing just the 2009 data set and the expression. Uh, yes. Maybe I was too fast uh, so that. Uh, there is a, a clue. So I will show it again. Yeah, I think they were shown 2009, 10, and 11 are perfectly compatible. Sorry if it is, uh, was uh, too fast. So this, uh, this, is, uh, this comparison is made at the blind uh, level. So you see you have a comparison which uh, um, 
the concern the data taken at the different periods of time in 2009, 2010, 2011. And then we made also a comparison. We made two bins, one for the data taken during the night and one during the day. And there is no difference within the system of the uh, statistical uncertainty in the same spring plus fall versus summer. Okay, David. Yes, first a general comment. Um, you're, you're not measuring any vectorial quantity here, so the title of the paper should be neutrino speed, not velocity. So that's the first comment. Uh, now, so the main issue here, I think, is that you have a time of flight measurement, and uh, you only have two measurements for the numerator, the geodesy. Can you go back to slide 32, please? Because you keep claiming that you measure things over three years, but your distance is measured only twice. And the two measurements here, I want to understand how the GPS, the X, Y, Z, T uh, coordinates, they, ch they are different in the third uh, significant figure, but you claim uh, uncertainties in the seventh uh, significant figure. So I want to understand what that. So here, you see, yeah, yeah, this one here. I skipped that, sorry. Yes, yeah, sorry. Right. Uh, here, this one. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I, I see here differences in the third significant figure. I mean, in the different GPS, and uh, but the end things combined down to uncertainties in the seventh significant figure. So I want to understand. Point. Huh? These are four different points. It's not the same point measured the four times. Maybe I was not clear on that. Uh, uh, I, I mentioned that we installed two benchmarks at the two sides of the tunnel. Benchmark means a reference point. So these are kind of monoliths that you measure. And two are uh, Teramo side and three and four are L'Aquila side. And you get the coordinates of these four uh, reference points, but you should not compare among themselves. I think that the, the, the key thing here, because we are, I mean, it's an, a very important result, if it holds true, I think is to really remeasure this distance, I think. Yeah. What, what about re general relativity effects? Are those taken into account in this? Are so those corrections important? So, so that's, that's a question that's from so outside we, about we, that. We took into account the general relativity uh, effects at the level of the clocks, uh, because the clocks in Gran Sasso and uh, at CERN, they are not at the same height. And, but you have to take into account that these two clocks are not free running. They are continuously resynchronized through the common view mode. So this effect is at a level of 10 to the minus 13. Yeah. <laughs> Just a moment, there was a question. Uh, yes. Uh, your likelihood analysis gives information on a constant delay. Uh, what happens if the delay is not constant for some reason? Yeah. Okay, so this is also a good question because it's a really uh, model uh, related in the sense that uh, when you uh, try to analyze this data with respect to a particular theoretical model, you get some uh, uh, dispersion relationships and you should uh, uh, have a, a, a shift, but also energy dependence, this kind of uh, uh, effects. So we deliberately decided not to go to this kind of procedure, but this is something that it could be done in, uh, in the future. Okay, uh, yes, please. I want to ask a simple question. Uh, is there a chance that uh, due to some temperature variances between the above the Grand's atmosphere and the Grand's so and the there's a somewhat constant shift or varying shift between the GPS signals. Did you consider this? Okay, no. Uh, yes. For what concerns the, the, the GPS signals, uh, there are the main corrections are at the level of the ionosphere. So it's not the local uh, temperature. And these are uh, taken into account with this uh, P3 code, which is the combination of two different frequencies, which allow you to reconstruct the, uh, rela um, the special relations in the ionosphere. So then there are some si si uh, residual systematic related to the P3 code. There is another kind of combination which is more precise, which allows you to perform measurements at the 100 picosecond level but we were not interested in uh, such accuracy. For us, one nanosecond was uh, more than enough. I have, uh, okay, Maurizio, I think maybe we should try to finish. Can you go back to the, the plot where we showed the difference between no effect and the effect yes. curves on top of your points? 
Do you agree that the effect is completely driven by the plots on the right? I mean, if I look at the plots on the left, I would say that two... Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, there is also an effect... <laughs> Okay, no, no, it's uh, not this one. I have to go. Which plot are you looking for? Yeah, I, I know what he, uh, he wants to see. Yeah, it's one. Yeah, this okay, one. this one. Okay. So, as I said, this is part of the picture, but you can see that there is also an effect of, uh, it's difficult to judge by eyes, eh, because then you have to take into account also the fluctuations of the points, but you see that there is a systematic effect also on this side. And then you have to combine with the other extraction, which is shown uh, in the other page, where you can also see that there is a, a, no, a wait, systematic wait, wait, wait. shift. Wait, if I look at the one on the bottom, it has the same fluctuation on the other no, side. No, the fluctuations are there because... Oh, no, but if there is a directional fluctuation for the top P figure to prefer to go above the curve as much as I see in the center of your figure the same tendency of the points to be below your curve. So I would say that the, on the left, the, the fact that the 60.7 is preferred with respect to zero it's a less evident sta statement, not at the six sigma level, of the fact that on the right, I see, I mean, on the right, it's, it's I mean, if I do a binomial test on the plot on the, on the top right, the, the one on the top is completely crazy. So what I'm wondering is, are we sure that the red curve that you measure here, it's not deformed by the fact that, the fact that you're measuring the neutrinos up to 730 kilometers is by itself uh, a selection rule that is biasing the shape. Well, there are very, uh, which kind of systematics do you assign to the red Selection shape? rule uh, on uh, neutrinos arriving uh, to Grand Sasso, so this is what you mean? I mean, what, what I'm saying is that are we sure that what you're getting in is an, an unbiased sample of the protons that are starting at CERN, uh, or maybe you're getting a shorter view of the beam profile. Yeah. So this uh, goes to the comment uh, I, I, uh, I answered before, in the sense that as far as we know for what concerns the uh, beam uh, stability, the, 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 the way the beam works, uh, what we see in the BCT is entirely co uh, converted in neutrinos, and there is not uh, such a dependence uh, for what concerns the uh, space position uh, of the neutrinos which are detected uh, by OPERA. I don't know if somebody from CNGS, Elias, do you want to add something? Uh, <laughs> yes. Maybe, uh, Dario, you should stress that the fit is done globally. Yes. So all the peaks sure. and valleys that you have in the center part play a role yeah. in, in, the, yeah. in the overall fit. So this is just an expansion, a, a zoom of the, of the, of the tails. Huh? Don't forget that there is a, yes. a wide section of peaks and valleys. The measurement, I guess, is completely dominated by the turn on and the turn yes, off, because if I look at the curve on the plateau, I can fit everything on that. Yes, I think it's the age of the most important There is also a role of what is happening in the middle. Okay. I have also a question on this point. If you go to the previous one where you see the overall thing, I wonder... No, the one in which yes, yes, I'm, the I'm, I'm going there. Okay. Just a second. The, my, my question is, what are the parameters? You, you also have a normalization parameter, not only... Because, yeah, you must have also a normalization parameter that you can play together with the shift. And looking to the other picture, it seems to me that 
If you would allow a difference in normalization, you would, even the delta t equals zero would not be so bad. In other words, how many, you, are, you don't have, uh, you have two things to worry. One is the, sh the delay, the moving, but uh, you also have a normalization, and the two things uh, could, play, could be played together. So, uh, for what concerns the normalization, we are uh, uh, normalizing uh, the curves on the number of events. So every uh, waveform, proton waveform, is normalized to the event which has been observed. If you take the area of these two curves, of the data and the proton curve, they correspond, they uh, correspond to the same number of events. So the normalization is fixed in this procedure. It's not uh, free. But not when you compare with the protons. Yes, with the protons. Normalized to the number of neutrino interactions that we record in Gran Sasso. But non, not normalized through the cross-section. Eh? Normalized in the way that the, the two distributions correspond to the same number of events. You have a comment? Yeah. Yes. Um, so just to re reformulate uh, the comment by Maurizio. Um, you are sampling only the core of the neutrino beam, which is quite broad at the Gran mm -hmm. Sasso. So can it be that this time distribution is shortened because you are sampling the, the particles which, you know, come most directly, because this is what he was asking for. It, this, is, uh, this plot is showing a, a one microsecond shift, mm -hmm. but the other ones are showing the difference between zero and 60 mm -hmm. nanoseconds over uh, I don't know, 10 microseconds. Mm -hmm. So if you get a shorter burst, because mm -hmm. you are sampling the core of the beam, mm -hmm. then what he was saying is that uh, you are just sensitive to the ending, so the turn off of the the distribution, and this could make a shift, which is not really a shift, it should be a shrink of the distribution. So this but, is the suggestion. Yes. What, what do you mean by uh, wh which kind of a relationship do you see between uh, the core of the beam and the timing? That's the main uh, question. I'm, I'm not saying ah. that this is the reason. I'm saying that okay. he was asking whether okay. you kept the the uh, stretching of the distribution as a free parameter. Yeah, no, we didn't, we, didn't, we didn't kept the stretching as a free parameter because this is also related to the possible dispersion and the energy de the dependency. So, but then for what concerns your uh, hypothetical relationship between uh, the core and the timing, if you want the distribution of neutrinos in Gran Sasso is just uh, broad because of the pion, uh, the, the PT in the pion decay, is not really related to the timing issue of what you measure in the BCT. So this kind of uh, relation is uh, accidental. There is no correlation between the position in Gran Sasso and the timing that we measure itself. It would be very hard to explain this kind of relation. If the, the horn would become weak at the end of the beam speed, okay, for example. Okay, that's a good uh, question as well. <laughs> You have, you have muon detectors which should be able to tell you whether the distribution at the beginning of the spill or at the end of the spill is the same, right? Yeah. Yes. At least in the picture in your, in yeah, your paper there is muon de detectors which... So for what concerns... <coughs> may I answer him uh, first? So for what concerns the horn, the excitation of the horns lasts over uh, uh, several milliseconds. So we are just... Uh, uh, sampling uh, uh, a small part of it. I think that this plot it is not even uh, corresponding to the reality. It should have been zoomed on the flat part uh, of the horns. Yeah. Okay. I thought, uh, there are so many questions, but we yeah. should... Uh, uh, well, there was one over, over, over there first, but can you shout or, or use the microphone, yeah. please? And then, then, uh, okay, so, this is a question purely about analysis, which is what you said was the third group. Yeah, yes, we are already... Uh, fine. Hi, Dario. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned that for the internal events, you make a division into two energy bins uh, to check for effects. But for the external events, there is a correlation between the energy of the incoming muon and the distance travelled by the neutrino from the beam line, because the different mu because muons. Uh, Neutrino to muon interactions taking place in different parts of the rock see a different amount of DEDX. 
So do you want to comment on that? Yeah, yeah. No, I understand what you mean. Uh, uh, you don't know really where these muons have been generated, but I also showed you that if we remove completely these external uh, muons, we get uh, a result which is completely compatible within the systematics. This, is, this was one of the cross-checks that were shown. Right, but it's... Uh, you could look for the same effect using something that only did, for example, I'm asking you to comment really, because you could look for the same effect using something that only did mu. For a question, then we stop, I think, because we, uh, there we was no end. The, okay, so Bob first. Could we go back to the edge plot again? I hate to be type, ask a typecast question, but uh, so, so if I remember correctly from uh, Edie et al. and uh, Fred James's book, if, if we idealize to a rectangular distribution, the uh, maximum likelihood estimate of the, of the location of the distribution just depends on the two extreme points, the average of the two extreme points or something like that. And so I believe that your precision is coming from the... It's hard for me to believe that your precision is coming from the wiggles in the middle of the distribution. So I think we're close to the idealized case where it's, it's the edges that's giving you your precision. And therefore, the chi per, per degree of freedom, which is about one, using the whole distribution does not really indicate no. how good the fit is, where you're fitting. So if you just chop off the whole flattish part of the distribution and fit to those two tails, I think one will get a much better sense of, the, of how good the fit is. And, and, and the lower right curve doesn't look, you know, has a few points that are off, let's put it that way, but quantifying that, I think. Okay. Would be, yes, we didn't put the numbers easy. on the on the on the Pardon? slides. Pardon? We didn't put these numbers on the slides, but you're right. One could quantify it in terms of chi chi square in these regions, but uh, I do not remember the number by earth. I don't I, I don't have them on the slide. Okay. Just. Yeah. Uh, just part. Okay, one more here. Okay. Yes. You haven't said much about supernova uh, data, except that it's in the paper you mentioned that this is at 10 MeV, whereas you operate at 20 GeV. But you showed in your uh, systematic checks that there was no energy dependence in your data, but you sort of say that you reconciled uh, with the supernova exclusion at 10 to the minus. Nine by saying, yeah, but that was at 10 MeV. Is there a chance you can reproduce the experiment at a different energy, for example, or, or how do you cope with that? So how do we cope with that? This is a question related to the physics. Yeah, I think that we so have to <laughs> read interpretation. I mean, yeah. as you have seen, they don't have the lever arm to do the energy dependence. They just yeah. show you that yeah. uh, there is no uh, obvious energy dependence, but that's all. I mean, yeah. uh, no, not cope philosophically, but what? you know, you say that you show your your. Show that we cannot claim an energy dependence within the accuracy of our measurement. Okay. Yeah. But by the way, then I, I think if we want to look at energy dependence, we should also look at this old uh, Fermilab data because they were yes. they were going up. They, although their accuracy was uh, uh, worse, they were going up to 200 GeV. So one should put all the points together. Uh, last word to Gigi, and, and then maybe the last the last last word Anton, Antonio would like to say. Discuss a few all words. the discorrelation things that we were discussing with many questions. Would it be possible to take data? in the future with very, with, uh, very much bunched protons so that uh, you get them every five nanoseconds to answer to all these questions. Huh? Yeah. And also in that case, you could really show that you can communicate to Grand Sasso faster than the speed of light that you, you cannot do yet. Yeah, no, no, that's a good uh, suggestion. In the future, we, we may think to play with the time structure of the beam. This is something that, for instance, the people in the U.S. Uh, will do for the next measurement, for sure. I have another suggestion, which before I give to Anthony. Mm -hmm. Could one not bring a piece, you know, just one scintillator of the opera detector or something like that, and, and with the same electronics, put it at the end of the neutrino beam, use different GPS, so as if it was completely independent uh, experiments, 
And then you would, should find zero because I think you are really yeah. at 100 me, uh, at a one kilometer or less than a kilometer. Right, right. Would it be a possible? I mean, a cross check of doing a near experiment where yeah. you should find zero. I mean, it's, it's a possibility to, to be investigated. Yes. Okay. So Antonio, I statistical uncertainty at this level of the, about seven nanoseconds. Jürgen, yes. Find the microphone.